I want to introduce Liam White, Lee and Robinson White, one of the two best looking young men. In the circle of life, the world you. Operation Shoebox will be November the 2nd here at the church. This is a major, major mission of the church here. Uh, Donna Saylor heads this up for us. Is Donna in here now? Uh, Donna, stand up and wave. She is our point person for this. Uh, what it is, if you'll take these sheets, is we get shoe boxes and fill them, as many as you want to fill. That night, we will have a program. That's our official day to bring them back. We'll stack them all up here at a point in our service. This gives you ideas of what needs to go in the shoebox. There's things that can't go in for obvious reasons. We'd buy a squirt gun and not think a thing about it. In some third world countries, that would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. So if you will look on this sheet and use it appropriately, I want to encourage people to do as many shoeboxes as possible. Um, and both sides will give you suggestions and things that could be used. Also, um, it asks, please include only new items. This is not a clean out the closet program, but it's a program for young children around the world that will have the gospel uh, attached to this gift. And it, it has a lot of importance to it. Uh, also, this sheet will tell you more about it. As the video you just watched was telling you, you'll hear more about it as we go along. We are a regional, I believe, district, what word should I use, Donna? Regional um, pickup point, drop-off point. So we'll need some volunteers. If you want to see Donna to come work, because as these come in, they'll come from other churches and individuals. There'll be several thousand boxes come through our church, and they'll be dropped off here. We'll have a tractor-trailer here. They'll be loaded, taken to another area, and then distributed. A couple of Wednesday nights ago, uh, some of you were here and met, maybe for the first time, or heard Wes Norton, who is a, a mission pilot that we support that at this point in time is assigned in South Florida, flies into Haiti uh, on a daily basis. And if you notice in the video, he showed Samaritan's Purse uh, materials going into Haiti. It's not the shoebox program, but uh, Samaritan's Purse uses them to deliver uh, needed, very needed products to the missionaries that are working with some of the poorest people in the world in those areas. So, um, This is a tremendous program. It's worldwide. Uh, I don't even think we need to consider what it does as an ambassador point of view for our country, but more importantly uh, for the gospel of Christ. So we're proud to be a part of it and hope everybody here will participate and try to set a goal by next week. Uh, we're getting a phone call, and it's an important one, so wait just a second. Hello. Hello, Abraham. You hear us? Uh, this is India. Who's there? Mike? Tater? Tater? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. That's a dumb question, Tater. It's the same way it was. How's everything in India? <laughs> We're having a great time here. We've done a four church dedication. And uh, we did two on Saturday and two today. It's Sunday night here. 
How was the youth church dedication? The youth church dedication was amazing. We had uh, 1,600 people in attendance, and uh, Brandon preached, and uh, it was great. We had 150 baptisms, and uh, made rice distribution, give out Bibles. The orphanage that's located at that church. It's great. Tell us about. Okay. Yeah. Hey, David. Yeah, you're talking to the whole church. Four hundred more than you ever will again. <laughs> Tendance here, Brandon, has really been growing and it's way down this week from last week's sermon. A lot of people aren't coming back. Yeah, did they tell you your ticket was one way? Where's Caleb? He's out here. Actually, uh, we're celebrating tonight because I think Caleb got engaged a lot further in the week, and later on we're going to marry him off, the way I understand it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to let you go because we're worshiping. It's not Sunday night here. We're not goofing off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll let you go. We'll talk to you next Sunday. Okay, okay. Have a good rest of your life, Caleb. I heard you're getting married in India. Uh, supposedly. I'm not sure how these things work, but uh, apparently I said yes. We'll send you a moped as a wedding gift. All right. <laughs> okay. I did, I did get three goats. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, bye-bye. Let me say, they get three goats. They get on the train tonight, uh, or today, and do their train ride. I talked to them last night. As you heard him say, there were 1,600 people there. And teenagers, that's a church where there wasn't a church. That uh, your giving, your sacrifice built 1,600 people there. <laughs> and I say teens to this group over here. There's a bunch, but they're scattered all throughout, so... You all did a lot for the gospel of Christ in that. I want to take a minute uh, today to tell you what we're going to do. We've got a powerful worship service planned, but one of the things, or what I'm going to emphasize today, is a concept of God and how that can be misused and is used and even becomes an idol and what the person of Christ did to really rattle our lives. And we're going to read some hard scripture, but I want it to be scripture that we read as a church looking at all of our lives, where we are, uh, how we've thought about our faith, how we've thought about God, and uh, what this has to say to us as we live with other people. So I hope it'll be a time of really doing some, some very serious thinking about our own lives today as we, as we read the Scripture together and learn from it. Are you ready to worship, church? Let's stand together and we'll have, we'll have a word of prayer together. And let's prepare our hearts for worship as we pray. Father, thank you that we can worship, that we know the joy of worship and the hope of worship. And Father, we pray that you bless us today, that what we do will be pleasing to you. Not just for us, Father, but more importantly and above everything else, pleasing to you. Father, we humbly ask that you forgive us of sin, 
that stands in the way of our worship, that you broaden our minds and our hearts to understand who you are through the person of Christ. This is your time given to you collectively as a group of Christians. And Father, we pray together that from this moment on, it's not about me, but it's all about Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. this morning and greet one another.
1 John 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten. Throughout heaven's eternal days On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Lord of vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love no love is higher no love is wider no love is deeper no love is truer no love is higher no love is wider no love is your love, O oh Lord. No love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is like your love, O oh Lord. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness. 
sweetest as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who his love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day No love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is like your love, O oh Lord. No love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider. No love is like your love, O oh Lord. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days who his love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal Matthew 25, verses 37 through 40 reads, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of these of the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. Who are these, the least of these, my brothers? Are they the poor, the weak, the sick? Are they those who were born into poverty or in the wrong, perhaps in the wrong continent or under the wrong flag? Are they in the wrong family or living on the wrong side of the tracks? Is it the criminal? The drunkard, the addict, is it the gossip, the braggart, the manipulator, the con man? What criteria do we use, whether consciously or subconsciously, to decide who we serve or how much we serve? Do we consider their worthiness? Do we decide whether they deserve our charity? Mankind needed a savior. We all need a savior. And in the eyes of God, we must have certainly looked like, looked like the least deserving of grace. But while we were still sinners, Jesus gave his life for us. He did not consider our worthiness. In fact, in order to serve us, he became the least among us. Becoming sin for us, he carried it to the cross once and for all this table represents the body and the blood of christ what jesus gave for those who had separated themselves from him then and even now this is love let us pray <coughs> our dear and most gracious heavenly father again we thank you so much for all your many blessings and especially we thank you for your love to us. We come now at this time of worship. We lift your name in praise and in glory. And we ask that you accept our worship. 
And as Angie has led us in singing, there's no higher love, no deeper love, no truer love, especially as we come around this table, we are reminded of that very thing. And also with the marvel of modern technology, we have been brought to realize that your church here at Boone's Creek reaches all around the world. It is great to know that we can spread your name in all the world from right here. We also thank you for this time. And as we come around this table, as Jimmy has, has told us, to do this in remembrance of Christ, we almost, we have to, we have to remember that it is to the very least that this table was given. We have to always recognize that all that come to you deserve your love. And we ask you to bless these emblems and each person as they reach forth to take them. Forgive us where we come short. In thy name we do humbly pray. Amen.
let us eat the bread, the body of Christ. Drink the cup, the blood of Christ. Father God, we're grateful that we can come into your house and meet around your table and examine our hearts and our minds and, and look at our, our lives. Lord, as we come to this part of the service where we, we think about all the many blessings that you've given us, we pray that you will bless these tithes and offerings and they will be used in accordance with your will. Be with us and guide us in all that we do and all that we say. In Jesus Christ's name I do pray.
this morning just a little bit different than maybe we do, but the opportunity is here. Bree, I'm going to ask you to come up just a second. Okay. Um, Bree, as most of you know, Brianne Bodino is uh, undergoing some cancer treatments right now, some chemo, right? And it's been a rough week, to say the least, at it, with her first treatments. But I, I just felt like Brianne is a super young lady, Christian lady, and a fantastic opportunity to put a face with a name that when you read prayer lists, this is who we're praying for. So you're praying for Brianne and a lot of others, and I get to sport. Uh, did the students start this mm -hmm. at, at University High? Uh, it says, we wear till for Brie. So that is covering some cancer cost. But we're praying for you and a lot of others, and we just want to continue to do that. So here's who you're praying for and others we don't every week. You want to say anything? <laughs> here I'm going I've put her on the spot where's mama she in here back there I've put her on the spot Etna. sing a song for us Bree <laughs> you can go sit down here <laughs> If you ever go to the desert southwest, it's one of the most beautiful places you'll ever visit. I know many of you have had that opportunity. Jill and I were there in 1995, and I said, I want to move here. Uh, and I started trying to figure out ways we could move there. It finally dawned on me after the trip wore off that one of the things that made it beautiful is nobody lived out where I was looking. And there was probably reasons for that. So I could have moved there. There had been no job, but that wouldn't have mattered because we'd have died of thirst within a week or two anyway. But it's absolutely beautiful. When people think of Arizona, they think of the desert, uh, the, the desert and the high desert, uh, all the beauties of the rock formations and the red rock that's there. But one of the things that is gorgeous, one of the areas that's gorgeous there that people aren't often aware of is the, are the mountains. And there's an area near Flagstaff. Flagstaff sits at uh, 7,000 feet, to put it in perspective. If you've ever been or ever go to the top of Roan Mountain or Mount Mitchell, Flagstaff is five or 600 feet higher and a large city sitting at that altitude. And Flagstaff sits in the shadows of the San Francisco peaks. The tallest mountain in Arizona is Mount Humphrey, which is over 11,500 feet, so double Roan Mountain, and uh, that's the top of Mount Humphrey. On the side of Mount Humphrey is an area known as the Arizona Snow Bowl. It's, uh, it's a skiing uh, area, top-notch skiing area, and being the fabulous skier I am, some of you don't know it, but my nickname is Jean-Claude Ca uh, Clark, <laughs> but being the fabulous skier that I am, I went to the Arizona Snow Bowl at the best time of the year. The rates are very inexpensive. It was July. There was no snow and no waiting on the chairlifts. The skiing was terrible, but it was cheap. We went to the top of Mount Humphrey, Jill and I did. Uh, and to be honest with you, I can't ski a lick, and just the chairlift ride up scared me to death. But we went to the top of Mount Humphrey and got off and began to walk a little trail area. I came to a fence. Uh, I couldn't find a gate in the fence, a uh, wooden fence, and wanted to go on up just a few more feet to the very peak of the mountain. But there was standing there at the fence a um, Forest Service employee, a ranger. And I asked him about going on up and how did I get over the fence or around it. And he said I couldn't go on up to the top of the mountain, even though it was very, very close. And Naturally, the question is, why? What's, what's the reason? Because the view would be tremendous. The reason is that Mount Humphrey is part of the Navajo Reservation, and it's a sacred area to the Navajo Indian with the belief that departed loved ones go to live on top of that mountain in the presence of God, as they understand God, and that that is where God abides in the dead of winter. When the snow is the worst, the wind chills are the worst, absolutely impossible to inhabit the top of that mountain. That is where God lives. When you ask about the summer, 
where's God in the summer? Uh, he lives in the hottest, most inhospitable area of the desert with all of the spirits, as they would say, or souls of those who have gone on and are living with him. Now, that was very interesting to me. In the summer, the sacred dwelling is the hottest, and in the winter, it is the coldest. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Their faith tells them, Navajo Indian, and, and their, their worship of the land, their faith tells them that God survives and God thrives in the most extreme areas. It's not a belittlement of God. It is a recognition in their mind that God is so great that living in the extreme is where he needs to be. is so powerful that everything else would be boring to him. So just hear it that way. Their belief would be God survives and thrives in the extreme. His strength is marvelous. Every culture, and, and I'm going to ask him to go through some things real quick today, and I'm going to ask you to just really start thinking. It will be a sermon for you to think, and then some scripture we're going to read at the end will really challenge every one of us. Every culture has an understanding of God that places him in the extreme. He is so big, so large, so powerful. However you word it, it places him in the extreme where he sits and looks upon everything else or where he is in charge of the greatest of powers. And, it, and if you want a, an example that's very contemporary to us, why is it a culture can entertain, a, a growing culture can entertain a faith in God that says God is so extreme that young men can easily be recruited to strap on bombs and blow themselves up. Forget they're killing anyone else. Just lay that aside for a second. But a culture that entertains a view of God that's so extreme that he would call people and they would be willing in the prime of their life, in the youth of their life, to kill themselves, just to blow themselves up. And then the culture would idolize those who killed themselves as heroes. That's how extreme cultures view God. Now, just wrap your mind around all of that because we could be here and this would be a great class to, to spend a lot of time looking at how different cultures view God but always seeing the extreme. In 1965, in our, in our country, I was 11 years old, but I remember it because it was preached about and, and was ranted about in a lot of places. But in 1965, Time Magazine ran a cover page that was totally black and had in large font in red letters the question, Is God dead? And some of you maybe remember that. And it shook our culture, its foundation, that that would even be printed was considered blasphemous and, and probably sold more magazines than it had in a long time because preachers bought them. It made great illustrations. Is God dead? Do we believe he's dead, church? No. You know, and, and, and all, all of that type of thing happening. I decided in, in preparing this sermon, I'd like to read some of the stuff that went on at that time, what was written, and it, it led me to start looking at a lot of history leading up to that question, is God dead? But the discussion behind the article, and I'm not saying the articles that were there, but the discussions behind the articles had started many years earlier. Now, we could argue, somebody could say it started in 19-whatever or 18-whatever, and somebody else would say, well, no, it really started in 17-whatever. I'd say you go back to the New Testament times and the Gnostic Gospels, and um, some of the things they were saying started the whole discussion. But anyway, the discussion behind the article at that time had started many years earlier and with a very rapid growth in science, true science and what science had discovered, that science had answered many questions and thus destroyed many concepts that were held about God. Now, I'm going to give you examples because I think we look at science too often as our enemy, but uh, they had answered many questions and destroyed many concepts held by God. Now, this will come a circle, so just listen. If the earth is round, you go back a few hundred years, if the earth is round and orbits the sun rather than the earth is flat and the sun orbits the earth, then that destroyed a very deeply held concept. To us it sounds silly, but to the church at that time there was hostility over this, this idea that the earth could be round. It destroyed a concept, very firmly held concept of man's centrality and then the simplicity of saying heaven is where? Point toward heaven, everybody. Up. And the dwelling place of the dead, Sheol, hell is where? 
Well, a round globe blows that out the window, doesn't it? And if you've been in the church forever saying we'll go up to heaven and we'll go down to hell and you go bury somebody, you know, how far do you dig before you fall out the bottom? I don't guess anybody ever figured that out. But it destroyed those concepts, this true science of discovering the earth was round. So it led one of the first discoverers of that to never even mention it and the one who came along to say it to be excommunicated from the church even though they had deep faith. So you see what science began to do. The microscope and the telescope rapidly changed some concepts of God in that people began to say, God doesn't dwell in the streams. Uh, God doesn't dwell in the clouds. God doesn't dwell in the mountaintops and in the oceans. And it led to coming from an atheistic nation, a cosmonaut, and some of you remember this, uh, circling the globe and radioing back to tell his comrades on earth, I have been to space and I did not see God. Now that sounds just unbelievable to us. But keep in mind the 60s and early 70s are just a very short time ago. We, we think of them as a long time ago because we think in terms of our births and deaths. But it's a very, very short time ago that man going to the moon was just pushing the envelope to unbelievable proportions. And the envelope's our next door neighbor in an apartment, you know, in all of space. That envelope, or the, the moon is just in the next room next to us. And yet we look at it and are in awe that man's ever walked on it. Well, a cosmonaut goes into space with all the unknowns about space and says, hey, I'm here. You all keep lifting your hands and praying. I didn't see God. He doesn't dwell up here 200 miles above the earth. Now, that, that is a lot of little things in a nutshell, but very rapid. I mean, you can, you can tie it all together and come up with scientific discovery after discovery that would lead people as early as the 19th century to write that God is dead and one man to say God not only is dead, he's been killed by science. And it was a man who hated uh, the church, but it was a man saying what science has done has destroyed the reverence of God that we've had. It's much the same way as, as turning on the lights in a darkened room removes the mystery. I remember as a, a child, I've maybe shared this with you before, but I remember as a child going to a, a great aunt's house, and, and her house was made, you could run circles around it, you know, like you will little kids inside, your kitchen and living room and a bedroom and a door, and you just fly around it. And like a lot of old houses, of course, it had an upstairs, and right there next to the little place going from the bedroom into the kitchen area was the steps. Now, what do steps say to a four-year-old? Climb them, you know. Now, back then, and this, this will throw, blow your all's mind, back way back then, okay? Way back then, parents didn't waste money on things like gates to keep you from going. They figured an older brother or sister or a younger one was worth the sacrifice of breaking their neck to teach the rest of the children and family, I told you not to climb those steps. <laughs> See what it did to your brother. He'll never speak right again. <laughs> you know, I told you not to climb him. So you run through, but they had a fail-proof gate at this great aunt's house. I'll never forget it. Now, my mom, you know, I, I go see a, a psychiatrist every week because of things she did to me. <laughs> but my mom, and she didn't remember this, but my mom took me to the base of the steps one time, and cousins all standing there and said, you don't want to go up there. Yeah, I do I'm going to tell you why you don't want to go up there. There's bears that live up there. <laughs> well, I'd run through that house, and I'd get those steps and go, because what kid wants to be eaten by a bear? <laughs> you know, I'd be petrified just going along. But then an older cousin or brother or somebody went by one day, and we're looking up where the bears live, scared, wonder if we could outrun one if it comes. And they go, blip. And the bears didn't live there any longer because they turned the light on. Now, please don't hear this wrong, church. Don't hear this wrong. I hope if you'd say one thing about me, I have a very, very deep faith in God. But science has turned some lights on to some preconceived ideas we've had about God. That's one of the things that's done that's good. In my mind, it's made God bigger. Okay? But, but I want you to just think about that. Now, if God is dead, let's stay at this discussion before we read some scripture. If God is dead, 
then, and, and you write these down to think about it, but I'm going to give you five or six things. If God is dead, and I want you to think about our culture. What are you going to do right now as I read these? Think about our culture. If God is dead, there are no absolutes. Aren't absolutes based on God's existence? Okay, there are no absolutes. What's a, a common uh, basis for marriage as we know it in the church? It's the absolutes of the scripture and talking about a husband and a wife. God's creation. But if God's dead, there are no absolutes, so we bring everything up for a vote. If God is dead, there is no real purpose to this life. And that leads us to all sorts of thoughts you know, uh, encapsulate and eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. There are, uh, there, there's just no purpose, and you might as well grab for everything you can. Um, if God is dead, design is simply man's projection upon what he's seeing. Now, let me say that again. If God is dead, everything we see in design is just man's projection upon what he's seeing. Have you ever stood in the forest this time of the year and, or, or maybe at a vista on the side of a road somewhere and looked at all the beauty of the fall colors and somebody say, I don't know how you can look at that and not believe in God. Another guy standing there may say, well, let me tell you how you can look at it and not believe in God. Let me tell you what chlorophyll does when the days of light become shorter and the temperatures become a little cooler and the sugars begin to change and all that stuff. I read about it and never do remember it, but all that stuff happens and these certain chemicals will turn red and these will turn yellow and all and then the leaf will die and dry up and blow on the ground. And I don't know what that has to do with God. You know, design is just simply man's projection upon what he's able to see. If God is dead, man is free to create his own morals so that a byphrase of today's world becomes, that's what you say. You know, we talk about the sacredness of marriage and keeping a marriage together, and somebody will yell, but it to death. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. And what they're doing is going down the road of creating their own morality. The old phrase, I'm okay, you're okay. The old phrase, you know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. If God is dead, the real world, the here and now, is our only concern. If God is dead, this last one, and this is the one I really want us to think about. I think it becomes the umbrella over any we could come up with. If God is dead, then man can create his own God. Man can create his own God. Now, God doesn't mean this physical death, but just we've turned some lights on and there are no bears in the closet. You know, we've learned so much. And so the whole basis, and it, and it, it is nothing new. It's absolutely nothing new. I'll go back to the Gnostics of the first century. It's absolutely nothing new. But we call it today humanism. And we start saying it, it's about man, the here and now. It's about what we can think of. It's about all the projections we can have. And the real world here and now is our only concern. So it leads not to a stewardship of the earth, which is God-ordained, but it leads to a radical environmentalist um, thinking that just destroys anything to do with man and being created by God and puts us equal with the tadpoles. And God never did that that we read about in, in this scripture, okay? But if God is dead, man all of a sudden can, can create, becomes his own God. I want to read you a quote from a conservative professor. I'm not going to give you his name because people go crazy when they get names anymore. And you can go on the internet and you decide, I'm going to find everything's wrong with that guy. And you go and Google what's wrong with, you know? And you decide, I want everything's right, what's right with. And we're creating our own gods, you know? So I just want to read what a guy said back in the mid-60s. He was a professor, a Ph.D., who observed and taught how culture interacted with religion. He was conservative. But I want you to hear what he says about God. He said, God, and, and I'm going to read this quote through in three parts. And he said, God is known to man only in terms of man's own culture. God is known to man only in the terms of man's own culture. Now, 
What he's saying is God is so big, we have to hang handles on him that we can understand from our culture. And we start abusing who God is. And then he added this, and thus God becomes basically an idol. We're making him up ourselves. Okay? Theologically speaking, continuing his quote, theologically speaking, any concept of God can only be an approximation. Now, let me, let me visit that statement for a second. Theologically speaking, any concept of God can only be an approximation. If something is so big, you can only approximate how it works. Let me give you a real world example. Tell me how electricity works. For the average person, tell me how we can set a camera right here, turn that camera on, the light goes into the lens, hits a little board, does some electronic things in the board, goes over a little antenna back to a box with the bigger antenna, shoots it up, it hits a satellite, bounces from that one to another one to another one to another one, down to an antenna, over to a couple of more antennas, and I can see Brandon. And Brandon can see me. We visit with our grandchildren wirelessly all the time in real time with cameras. Tell me how it works. And so you see, if you start talking this concept of God in the beginning, and we start going out with a Hubble, knowing, accepting in faith that God created, we go out with the Hubble and start finding it, it's bigger than we once thought then there has to become, because our minds are so little, some approximations. Okay? Then, he added this statement, which is powerful. Okay, this in Scripture, but I just thought it was a powerful observation from a Christian observing culture and Christianity. Only God, only God can have a totally true concept of God. Only God can have a totally true concept of God. God is so big that only God can understand God. Now I know what some of you are thinking. I got out of bed to come hear this sermon. But I want you to think. And see, if we, if we start talking about God this way, and just I've just touched two or three areas. That w this could be discussion after discussion. But if we start thinking about God this way, consequently, one culture will celebrate a God that dwells in the harshest weather of winter at 11,500 feet, and another will celebrate a God that is found in the reality of the season, so that you have God divided into parts, God of the fall and the spring, the harvest, the winter. And another culture will celebrate a God that we say lives in the hearts of man, making man the center of everything we worship and calling it God. Something happened. I didn't see it. Heard about it while we was on vacation. Harry Huff, a lot of you know, a friend of mine, comes here and visits quite regular and worships here. Um, Harry, uh, I got together with him Thursday and spent several hours with him running around. And Harry was telling me that... Uh, the state of Florida has a new license plate. And on the license plate it says, In God We Trust. And people were so excited about that that the license plate would say, In God We Trust. Um, you pull money out, what's it say on it? In God We Trust. And everybody thinks that's great, but it means something different to different people. It means something different to different people. Now, with all of this discussion, and I hope it's just making you think about God and how he's defined in different cultures and how even in the church, if I'd say, who's God? And everybody wrote, uh, somebody would say, God is love. That quotes scripture. And somebody else would say, God is judge. And that quotes scripture. You know, we define God even in this building in a lot of different ways. But in all of this discussion, and all of the thoughts, and I know many of you wrestle with this on a regular basis. With all we hear, being around universities and being around schools and being around entertainment today and all we wrestle with. In all of this discussion, what or who is missing? 
Anybody want to answer? Jesus. What would happen in the state of Florida if their new license plate said, in Jesus we trust? To the large Orthodox Jewish population living in Miami, what would they say? What would be said by the growing population Islamic in Orlando, in Johnson City? In Jesus we trust. Allow me to say it this way. Talk about God is cheap. Talk about Jesus is costly. It requires something. Now, Jesus didn't come just to let us get a look at him. John, the 10th chapter, won't be on the screen. John, the 10th chapter, verse 30. And I want you to listen to Jesus in his own words. This becomes radical. With everything we've discussed, this becomes radical. John, the 10th chapter, starting with verse 30. Now, you want to memorize a verse. Here, here's your six words to memorize. You can say you memorize the scripture. Jesus is speaking and says, I and the Father are one. Now, I'm going to paraphrase because of something we'll read just below it. I, 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 and, I and God are one. I and the Father are one. The Jews who had a very deep faith in God. They were God's chosen people, right? And listen to what it says, verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. See, when you throw Jesus in the mix, it gets all mixed up. The Jews who had a faith in Yahweh God, who we have a faith in, could not stand him to stand there and say, I and the Father in one, and they picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus answered them. I think this is a tremendous answer, obviously. I'm sure Jesus sitting at the right hand of God saying, well, I'm glad David Clark thinks I gave a good answer. I, I think it shows a little bit of sense of humor and its wisdom. Let me be more specific. But Jesus says, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And Jesus could have said, let's, let's just click off a few. John said all of them, the books of the world wouldn't contain them all. We just have a few. But Jesus said, let's, now you remember the day the widow was leaving and her son had died and she really had no one to take care of her. Plus it was her son and she's broken hearted, and it was the deepest pain any person can ever feel losing a child. And I went over and took him by the hand right in the middle of the casket in the funeral and said, get on up. Is that what you're stoning me for? Or maybe he said something like, you remember when the guy came and was blind, and, and I made a little mud with my uh, saliva and just touched his eyes, told him to go wash, and he did that ceremonially uh, the way you did it in your culture, and now he can see. Uh, maybe you want to throw a rock at me for that. Or maybe he said, do you remember when somebody had a little KFC to go bucket and I fed 5,000 people out of it? Colonel Sanders didn't like it. <laughs> but you all going to kill me for that? That's what he was asking them. Which one of these are you going to kill me for? And then it says in verse 33, the Jews answered him, it's not for a good work we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I know who God is, and you're changing it. I'm going to kill you. That's what they were saying. And how often do we do that? I've got this concept of God, and then Jesus comes along and messes it up. I'm out here telling everybody all about God and how he's going to get them or how he's just going to love them. And, and, and Jesus comes along messing it up because Jesus starts saying things of grave importance. He starts talking about there will be a judgment. And that bothers people who say, not my God. My God loves people so much that nobody will ever be judged. And Jesus says, there will be a judgment. And I and the Father are one. I don't like that. 
Y'all think you're better than everybody else, Jesus. No. I said, all men are sinners, and there'll be a judgment. And God loves you. Put all that together. Or maybe it, it upsets them when you start talking about a need for repentance. Or maybe it upsets people when they talk about there will be an eternity. And Jesus talked about those things. And that really messed people up. Now, turn with me to Matthew, the 25th chapter. And, and i tell you what I, I want to do. I was going to do this one week, and obviously it, it's taking some time. But understanding everything we can grasp hold of today, I want us to start just for a few weeks, three or four weeks, heading into the holiday season. Well, don't worry, we'll shift. We'll have the wise men here and all of that at the right time. But in the next few weeks, I want us to look at some of the things Jesus said that were just radical. Now, right here it comes, and if it's not radical to every one of us here, we're cold-hearted. We're hard-hearted. So I want to use some words of Jesus. He who has ears to hear, let him listen with what we're going to read. Matthew 25, starting with verse 31, Jesus describes a judgment. This is not all-inclusive of everything Jesus says, obviously, but it's very powerful. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Now that's Jesus is going to sit on the glorious throne, nobody else. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on the right with the goats on the left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. There's a lot of language in there that bothers us. First of all, he doesn't say anything about praying. He says, you came to see me. You visited. You spent some time with me. You gave her the most precious gift mortal man has. That's his time. And I think the implications of the quality of the gifts are absolutely amazing. I remember when I was a child, we'd collect food at school and churches to give to the hungry. Soothe their conscience, we'd all bring food. And I remember helping bag them up one time as a young boy, and it hit me even as a young boy. We go to church and we get a treat. We got a Hershey bar with almonds in it. And we got an orange. The smell of an orange today Reminds me of Christmas. We lived in Florida. People would say, oh, an apple. Reminds me of Christmas. The band would sell apples in Florida. The band here sells oranges. But we'd go out of the church, and they'd hand us a bag, and it'd have a Hershey bar in it and some chocolate drops. And that's back when you didn't worry about somebody handling them. They'd kill you with them. And we'd get some stick candy, and we'd get an orange and an apple. Santa Claus would come to church. And I remember getting the food together for the poor. Hominy grits. Who eats hominy grits? <laughs> Spam. Man, you went all out for the poor, didn't you? Here, in the name of Jesus, have some Spam and hominy grits. <laughs> sardines and mustard sauce. Anybody knows you eat sardines and oil. And the mustard sauce, your wife had made a mistake. So give them to the church, they'll give them to the poor, and they're starving, they'll eat them. <laughs> you know, it seems to me Jesus is saying, why don't you buy two sacks of groceries? They'll probably like what you like. Or why don't you spend a little more time with these people that are the least of these? Jill and I were in Dixie Crossroads this past week. And I, I mentioned the name of the restaurant because some of you have been there. You're dying now. You're dying. Best shrimp in the world. And, and we're leaving Dixie Crossroads. And as I was leaving, I had to do this to get out the door and get around 
of a group of young people, at these girls down here's ages, all of which were confined to wheelchairs. And they were coming to Dixie Crossroads, and every one of them had a, a young adult with them, college age or so, that, that is helping in a caretaker. And I noticed some of the young adults, if they had it, it was pierced. And if it wasn't pierced, it was tattooed. And some of it was pierced and tattooed. And I'm looking, thinking, why do you do that to yourself? Why do you do that? And I'm working on a sermon in my head. And I'm thinking, to the least of these, my brothers. They're giving their time. They may not know Jesus. But they've trumped some Jesusites on what they're doing. According to the scripture. According to the scripture. Verse 41, he'll say to those in his left, depart from me, you cursed, and to eternal. There's that word fire. There's that word prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was stranger and you didn't welcome me naked. And you did not clothe me sick in prison. You did not come visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick in prison, did not minister to you? And then he'll answer, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You take that little bit out of the scripture there and carry it with you. It will change your life. Because now you know who God is. I and the Father are one. And let me tell you what the Father's looking at. I listened to a powerful sermon last Sunday about baptism. I only know of one other guy could have preached it better. <laughs> but I listened to a powerful sermon last week about baptism from a Church of Christ minister who's been disowned by the Church of Christ. And he was wrestling. He stood up in front in two services of probably eight or 900 adults. And he wrestled. I know as a preacher what he was doing. He was wrestling with his own concepts. And, and as he went through it, I wrestled with him. And, and he talked about the holiness of baptism, the sacredness of baptism, and what it means. But he addressed, as he wrestled in front of us, with the idea that people have, if I've got to, you know, my son's never been baptized, I've got to get him baptized, I've got to do this, i and he, and he made the statement, I, I'll be paraphrasing, Kelly or Jill may remember exactly how, how Dan said it, but he made the statement, I know my children need to be baptized, I want them to be baptized, but I want more than that, that they have a relationship with Christ where they're living for Him, like Him. And, and what he was wrestling with was, I want it to be what it's supposed to be when they're baptized, a birth into Christ. Not an initiation into a culture that doesn't really know who God is and has, and has made him in their own, made an idol worship of him. Now, hungry, thirsty, in need, the quality of the gift, I, I think the implication is, is there. If, if Jesus would have said, and, it, and I don't mean this goofy, but if Jesus would have said, I love them so much, I'm going to lay my thumb on the board and let them hit it with a hammer. Well, I don't know, how can he do that? But the quality's not quite the same as saying, I love him so much, I'm going to let him nail me on a cross and kill me, is it? So the quality of the gift, by example, is an absolutely amazing thing that Jesus did. Now, I want to tell you, I know it's taking a little time. I want to tell you a real quick story. It's about a man whose name has one syllable. I'm not going to give you his name. But I'm going to call him Jim, just because it can be one syllable. Dan, Bob. Call him Bob. Bob did everything he could to destroy my ministry. Everything. I could go into details of things the man did to destroy my ministry. He even visited people and said, 
let's vote the preacher out at a congregational meeting. We don't need a preacher. We don't need elders. We can just run the church with the committee. And guess who volunteered to head up the committee and pick who would be on it? Bob. Now, that bothers you when you're a minister. And I, I think those here that have been preachers know more so what I'm talking about. More so. Preachers' wives know what I'm talking about. The church becomes your baby, in a sense. And I don't mean that in any way disrespectfully. It becomes so important to you when you're the minister. And then get rid of the, the relationship and the being called to preach and somebody trying to strip you of that. And just look at it. They're trying to tell me I can't support my wife and my children. I just want to get a vote and take that away from the person. So I'm going to tell you with all honesty. All honesty, and I've never told this to a big group. I don't think I've told this to my wife. I can tell you what hate is all about because I hated Bob. And had Bob died, I would have laughed out loud. I wished him dead at times. And I thought, if he dies and his funeral's at 5, I'll be there at 3 o'clock to stand in front of that casket and make sure he's in it. I hated him. Now, what do we say every Sunday we start church? It just happened, and we start doing it. From this point on, it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Ask me how I feel if I were to say, from this point on, it's not about me, but it's about Bob. And there was a time I would have refused to have said that. Now, why did I tell you that story? Because Bob was the least of these in my life. And every one of you sitting here have some people that are the least of these in your life. Now, we've gone beyond just the hungry. In prison, the sick. Some of you are sitting here today, and there's people in this building you just don't like. Let's be honest. She this, she that, he this, he that. Are you willing to say from this moment on, it's not about me, but it's all about? Now, I want to go back to my story. Bob was a jerk. And I had to do everything humanly possible to get over Bob's jerkdom. Well, Bob's still alive, and you know what? He's still a jerk. You know, we always have this view, I'll help them, they help themselves. I'll feed that guy, he'll get up and get a job. Jesus didn't say any of that. Jesus said, I'm going to take your concepts of God. I'm going to tear them apart. I'm going to bust them into a million pieces. It'll make some of you so mad you want to kill me and make others retreat back to start talking about God, 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 God. And you'll find one little section of Scripture and you'll hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and drive everybody crazy with it. But it'll be you making your little idol called God and saying, God and I are just like this. And Jesus said, no, maybe you need to look at what you have trouble doing and learn how to do it. Maybe you need to start saying, I'm more interested in what I'm for than what I'm against. Maybe you need to start saying, I need to go out of my way to love people I've been really ticked at. Maybe you need to start keeping your mouth shut. You know, you, you place it and quit complaining. Where are you, Eddie? Eddie said, I talked about complaining once in the sermon. He had nightmares that week. He'd wake up and I'd stand there, you know. But we just need to learn the least of these. And boy, that takes God off the mountain at 11,500 feet, and it places him on the street in a little town called Snowflake where the Navajo daddy is laying there drunk and his children are hungry, and instead of judging him, I buy the drunk a hamburger. That changes things, doesn't it? I started to title this sermon, God Out of the Box. Because the early Jews thought he lived in a box. 
but he lives around us. Now, first test is how do you treat the least of these? Let me close with these questions. Did he really raise from the dead? That's what makes the Christian faith different. It's not our concept of God. But what makes ours different is that a man who said the Father and I are one rose from the dead. Do you believe that? I remember sitting in a store. Paul was in high school and uh, they were trying to convince a guy named Richard Enns or some of you know him that a guy that had died over in Carter County, Richard knew him. And they'd, they'd read, his, uh, read his obituary in the paper and they said, Richard, you know Sam died? And he said, well, I don't know Sam. And they said, oh, sure, you know Sam. You ever had somebody do that? I don't. You know Sam? Sam died. I don't know Sam. Sure you do. You went to school with his first cousin in the third grade. You know Sam. I don't know Sam. And this guy kept saying, you know him, you know him, you know him. And finally he said, you know Sam. He died. And Richard said, I bet that's the first time he's done that. <laughs> that just cracked Paul and I up. So what I'll say sometimes somebody dies, not me, it did, but I bet that's the first time they've done that. But you know, Jesus raised from the dead. He's the first person to ever do it. He raised from the dead without anybody walking in the grave and praying over him. He raised from the dead without anybody taking his hand and lifting him up. He raised from the dead without any words being spoken over his body. He raised from the dead with nobody standing in the tomb and praying. He just got up and raised from the dead. He must be God. And when I see him, it brings God back to where I begin to understand that it's not about me, but it's about being a Christ follower, being an imitator of Christ. And all of a sudden, I begin to understand what Paul meant when he said, be imitators of Christ. Do you believe that? a serious question do you believe it not as culture told you that but do you believe it and I tell you if that's not the way it is I don't know why Brandon's in India if that's not the way it is I don't know why we've wasted money building churches because they all had a concept of God but it all is about Jesus and coming back to him then we can know God then we can know him we're going to sing a closing hymn, a hymn of invitation. If there's any decision that needs to be made public, I'm going to ask you to come right now. I thank you for listening, and I hope you'll take this today, ponder it, think about it, and who Jesus is in our lives. Let's stand together, and we'll sing.
Dr. Doc. Dr. Doolittle. Doc Doolittle is his name. I'm not going to give him your first name because I didn't think I'd ever know that. <laughs> but I know it's Doc now. My secret. Okay. Doc and I met uh, through a mutual friend here in the church at uh, McDonald's in Gray. And I think Doc's real nickname should be Lucky. We got to talking. He heard about my lawnmower incident, and uh, I heard about a lot of his incidents. This man has been at death's door several times, but they're all comical stories. That's, you, you live, we can laugh about them, can't we? So, but anyway, I want to welcome Doc today as a good friend, as a brother in Christ who has been worshiping with us and has come to identify with this congregation today. And Doc, I'm going to ask you to simply make a confession, the same one Peter made to Christ. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. God bless you, Doc. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Doc, his life, his personality. Father, it's a joy to be around. And I know life has brought him a lot of, a lot of interesting things, but I just pray that you'll bless him. That, Father, you'll bless him as we walk together, that we'll know you better. We'll be imitators of Christ. And that, Father, we can know you as God through Christ. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And again, I pray that you be with Doc, that you bless him every day of his life. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to tell you how Karen and I met. Jill and I are the proud owners of a leather couch and some leather furniture that Karen sold us, didn't you? Working in a furniture store, and that's how we met, and the invitation to church. She comes as a Christian, has been worshiping with us, and I'm going to ask Karen if she would, in the same way, to make that confession. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. And the Son of God. The Son of God. Thank you, Karen. Let's pray together. Father, please be with Karen in her walk. I know she is a strong Christian with a deep faith in you. Bless her, I pray, and her family. May her growth here be one, Father, that brings honor to Christ, brings honor to you. And Father, just help us, again, as we always pray, to minister to one another as Christ followers, as imitators of his. Father, we love you, and we, we praise you for hearing these confessions of Christ today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. She sold me a couch, and you didn't buy me a thing at McDonald's. <laughs> I probably got stuck paying for docs. So. Uh, let's, I owe you, okay. Karen will take you to lunch one day, but I'm not having, you know, it's not about me, it's all about doc. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's stand. We'll have closing prayer. <laughs> we'll doc, if you didn't come before God today, David would never have known your real name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we conclude our worship, we just thank you for inviting each of us into the intimacy of your presence. Our conscience has been pricked today. We've been encouraged to do things beyond what we have ever done, to think differently, and to enjoy the intimacy that we only know through Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>